All righty. Now, we are going to go through and we are going to continue in the book of Amos. Now, I know you all are thinking, wait a minute, you still haven't finished chapter 1 yet. I know you're thinking that. It's going to get a lot faster after chapter 1. Chapter 1 had a lot in it. It's really going to pick up, but I know you're wondering if we're going to get through it. We actually will start chapter 2 halfway through tonight. So we're all, just think we are progressing at a massive pace right now. Tonight we're going to be looking at more judgment on the Gentile nations. We're going to be looking at the Amorites and the Moabites tonight because God did not show favoritism to any of them, but he had different reasons to call judgment on each of them. <clears throat> First going to go through and look at Ammon. Now their sin that he talked about was murder of the innocent because they did some horrific things. You go through and read it, it says in 13, starting off, it says, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of the Ammonites and for four I will not revoke punishment, because they have ripped open pregnant women in Gilead, that they might enlarge their border. So I will kindle a fire in the wall of Reba, and, I sh it, shall and it shall devour her strongholds, with shouting on the day of battle, with a tempest in the day of the whirlwind, and their king shall go into exile, he and his princes together says the Lord. You know, that's a, that's a terrible sounding thing. To rip open pregnant women in Gilead. But that's what they did. Now if you go back and think, wow, that sounds terrible. If you remember back several years ago, the war in Bosnia, same things happened. They went in, were doing some genocide and going in and killed the Serbs, were actually going in to kill the Muslims. And what did they do? They basically ripped open a lot of pregnant women and killed the women as well. And it was in a form of genocide. genocide. And one day, they, it was, I believe it was right around 8,000 people they killed in one day. Wow, some terrible things. And that was not that many years ago that was Bosnia. Now come on forward to Hamas. And look what's happened just recently in Hamas. The horrific murders that have gone on. Beheading of little babies. You know, it's a, it, there's a lot of cruelty in this world. And there's a lot of evil in this world. And that's why we have to be lights more so in order to be able to shine for God. But if you look at Amos, Amos was bold to go into these areas. So let's go in. We're first going to look at Ammon. Now where Ammon is, there's Ammon right there. It's actually east of Israel, is what it is, east of the Jordan River. And so that's where An the Ammonites are. <clears throat> The Ammonites themselves, if you remember, they are descendants of Lot's incestuous relationship with one of his daughters. Now he had it with another one, and surprise, that's going to be the Moabites that we talk about in just a little bit. But through those incestuous relations, that incestuous relationship, there were two families of people that came out of that. They were family of the Israelites, but yet they were unbelievably vicious enemies and they hated each other. It's sad, but it's the way it was. In Genesis 19 it says, thus both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn bore a son called, and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also bore a son and called his name ben -Ami, And he is the father of the Ammonites to this day. So each daughter through that relationship had a son and through there a family of nations were born. <clears throat> now in it it said the destruction will be swift and furious. That's what it said in the, when he said for three transgressions or four. So he's going to come after them. And what this is meaning when they talked about it's going to be swift, it is going to be swift. And it is going to be full of fury. The Ammonites and the Moabites really have some difficult times down the line as they go. Now, the Ammonites actually had a god that they worshipped. It's Malcam, some call it Malcam. So there's, there's a few different things that they talk about. But one of the things that it was noted for and that they were noted for was infant sacrifice. So they would take their babies and they would burn their babies in order to give a, a token of esteem to their god. Unfortunately, that infuriates the real god. Their king shall go into captivity. Now, depending on who you read, 
where it talks about a lot of the, the people that I read, they think that when it says the king shall go into captivity, they were just not talking about the king of the Ammonites at that time. They were more talking about their god, this Malcolm is who they were talking about. It means more that God and their quote God and all of the followers will be destroyed, which did end up happening. And it happened, as you said, because Tilgath Pileser, the Assyrian king, comes in, and he, in one of the things that he says, it talks about the fact that Sanapu, the king of Ammon, paid tribute to this Assyrian king. And then you go and look later, 40 years later, Budialu of Ammon paid Sennacherib a tribute and actually kissed his feet. So these, quote, kings were taken off into exile, but it, they built some, again, a lot of the commentators really kind of believe that it, as much as anything, talked about their God being taken off, and then, of course, the country and the nations themselves being taken off. And their last stand seems to be against Judas of Maccabee. Um, we don't have a lot of history of that exact last stand, but if you go to the book of Maccabees, which is not a, you know, written book, uh, but it is one that is used a lot in historical things. People will look at it. But if you look at that, that's where it seems that Judas Maccabeus was really the last stand that the Ammonites had. Now, the interesting thing is where Reba Ammon was is actually Ammon Jordan today. It's, uh, it's kind of the same place, it's just east of the Jordan River there, but if you look there, that's where Amman is, and that is actually the site of what it used to be, but is now Amman, Jordan. Now there's very little that's left. But in 1 Chronicles it says, In the spring of the year, the time when the kings go out to battle, Joab led the army and ravaged the country of the Ammonites and came and besieged Reba. But David remained at Jerusalem, and Joab struck down Reba and overthrew it. There's a lot of history in Scripture that we look at when you go through and look at what the Ammonites were and who they were. A lot of things happened in Ammon. <clears throat> Today, again, in Ammon, if you go through and look at Ammon, Jordan, there's an actually kind of an L-shaped hill that they call the Citadel. And this is the location where Reba actually was at that time during the, the period of when all of Amos was there. And the, it was actually the capital city of the Amorites at that time. Now, this is kind of what's left of it. There's a thing called the Temple of Hercules, and there was actually a 6,000-seat amphitheater that was there at the time. Now, a majority of this has been destroyed. There isn't really a lot except for these remnants that were there. But this is actually all that is left. But if you go to Amman, Jordan, this is, you can actually see these kind of things at the Citadel. Now, the history of Reba. First off, cities, it was a city that David's general, Joab, actually went in and successfully conquered. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing of what ended up happening, but this is one of the, there's a lot that happened in Reba, Amman. Close to its walls, if you stop and think about it, do y'all remember the story of Bathsheba and David? Unfortunately, David... He sinned with Bathsheba. He got her pregnant. Her husband Uriah was off at a battle. And that this battle was at a point. He ended up getting her pregnant. He called Uriah back. Told Uriah, go in and you can spend the night with your wife. He wouldn't do it because a very noble man. He said, while my brothers are out fighting a war, how can I go in and enjoy pleasure with my wife while they are out in the field fighting? So he slept on the steps. He tried getting him come bringing him in to eat. David brought him in to eat with him, tried to get him drinking or he'd be drunk and go back, but he still didn't. So David plotted in order to be able to have him killed. Well, you'll see in this why it's, there's actually a, a, someone who is quoted who has been at the walls of Reba looking down from some of the stuff, and you'll see why it was a pretty good place for David to send Uriah if he wanted him killed. It's, um, it, the t city had been torn down a lot, and then it was, in, it was taken over by the Greek-speaking cities, um, and it was in, they changed the name to Philadelphia while it was under Greek rule. Now, after the Roman influence kind of subsided and went away through after the times that came down, it ultimately was renamed Ammon, just literally in the memory of the ancient Amorites, or Ammonites, pardon me. 
But again, very little remains of that time. So, this is a description where I talk about the thing with David. Um, there's a gentleman named, named Dean. I'm not sure who he is specifically, but he was at the walls of Reba. And this is what he wrote. He said, the massive walls, some of which remain in ruins, rise from a precip... Oh, I left the M off of from, sorry. From the precipitous sides of the cliff. I bent over them and looked down, she looked sheer down about 300 feet into one wadi. I guess a wadi is a deep area. I don't know. I'm not familiar with that word. So, And 400 feet into the other. It did not wonder at its having occurred to King David that the leader of a charge against these ramparts would have met with certain... That's supposed to be death. Boy, I was typing too fast. Certain death, consequently assigning the position to Uriah. So here's this fortress that there's a 300-foot drop on one side, a 400-foot drop, and you stop and think that a story is about 10 feet tall. So you got like 40 foot drop off here. I mean, 40 story drop off here and a 30 story drop off here. It's pretty easy for guys up top to pick off people down below. So you want somebody killed? Put him at the front of the lines and everybody back off of him. He's a target for anybody and everybody. <clears throat> in 1 Samuel, another thing that happened uh, in, uh, to the Ammonites. There was a man named Nahash who was an Ammonite. And it says, Then Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. Now, Jabesh Gilead is an area that was part of the, um, if you remember the tribes, the uh, Manasseh and Dan, and the half, I mean, half tribe of Manasseh and Dan, and blah, I just drew a blank, um, are the other tribe <laughs> that was in there. We'll have it in a minute. But they stayed on the east side of the Jordan, whereas actually everything had been promised on the west side. But they wanted to stay there because of the fertile fields for raising their cattle and, and livestock and things like this. So they stayed on the east side of the Jordan. Now that inherently put them at a little more risk because all of the other Israelites were west of the Jordan. So it put them in a little bit of a risk there, and there are a lot of people who did end up attacking them. Now, one of the things you have to look at, this was a time of warring people. Because if you had a tribe of people, and you attacked and you conquered, you expanded your area. It just was the nature of the game back then. They would go in and try and conquer surrounding areas in order to have a bigger area to rule. It says, Then Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead, and all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a treaty with us, and we will serve you. But Nahash the Ammonite said to them, On this condition I will make a treaty with you, that I gouge out all of your right eyes, and thus bring disgrace to all, on all Israel. Now, the thing you look at this, this bothers me for a few reasons. One is, the Israelites in Jabesh Gilead, they were servants to the one almighty God. And what were they doing? They say, hey, we'll be your servant. So they were betraying God in that. And secondly, O Nahash wasn't just wanting to destroy the people at Jabesh Gilead. He was wanting to bring disgrace on all of Israel. So there's a lot involved in this little statement that the people, of, the men of Jabesh Gilead did. Now the question that I have for you, why the right eye? Anybody have any thoughts? What do you have, Thaden? But it could be some culture, right eye, the sense of, the right eye was a sense of pride or something. Yep. That is what I heard most of the commentators say, and that is that most people were right handed. You fought with a shield. Your right eye would be outside this side, like this side of the shield. If you lost your right eye, you were having to pull yourself out and making yourself more susceptible to attack. It pretty much would have negated your ability to fight. So they realized, again, according to commentators, I thought that was a great thing, Hayden. I hadn't thought about that one. But if you stop and look at it, this not only 
is taking over the country, but it is also making it more difficult for them to eventually have an uprising back against them. So that's what a lot of the commentators felt. Now in 1 Samuel 11, 5 through 7, when all of this came up, Saul really, he, Saul had never been in a battle or done anything like this before. But if you go on and continue, it says, Now behold, Saul was coming from the field behind the oxen, and Saul said, What is wrong with the people that they are weeping? Now this is again talking about Nahash and what he was going to do. So they told him the news of the men of Jabesh. I said Jahash, Jabesh, pardon me. And the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul when he heard these words, and his anger was greatly kindled. He took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hand of messengers, saying, Whoever does not come after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out as one man. So here's Saul. He's out and about. He comes back in. Everybody's weeping and upset. And he says, what's the deal? And he said, well, Nahash is wanting to come gouge our right eyes out and take over Jabesh. But in, second, in 1 Samuel 11, 8 and 9, it says, when he mustered them at Bezek, talking about all of the people who came in after he had summoned them and said, whoever does not come, this will happen to your oxen just as well. So the people of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah 30,000. And they said to the messengers who had come, they shall say to, you, say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you shall have salvation. Now this was Saul's first battle that he did. He went in and they conquered them. He had 330,000 men who ended up coming. And the next day, Saul put the people in three companies, and they came in the midst of the camp in the morning watch and struck down the Ammonites until the heat of day. And those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. I'd say Saul and the men wiped him out pretty good. They destroyed them a lot. If that's, yeah, that sounds good, whatever. Now I'm going to kind of show you what happened here. If you stop and look at this, these are the different paths that happen. Right up here, there's the Jordan River. Again, you've got the tribes uh, on the right and the, on the east side and the tribes on the west side. Right up there is where Jabesh Gilead is. Now here is actually where the Ammonites, where Nahash and all of them came from to go up and were going to be taking over the city of Jabesh Gilead. Well, Saul was down in Gibeah. So he was kind of having to hook it to get up there because the people of, of the Ammonites were already up there. Now, one good thing the people of Jabesh Gilead did is they said, can you give us seven days to think about this? And for some reason, probably God, I would give credit to, but he said, sure, I'll give you seven days. Seven days is a lot of time to be able to come in and pull people up. Plus, in Scripture it says, we want to see if we can get enough people to come up and help us to fight you. I'm sorry, if I'm going to beat you, I'm going to come in when you're at your weakest. But he didn't. And so ends up, the Amorites were, Ammonites were all destroyed, to where except they went off and no two of them were together. A lot of stuff went on in Am with the Ammonites. So here's about David and Nahash. After this, the king of the Ammonites died. So apparently, this is later on down the line, Nahash apparently ended up, they were subservient to David, but apparently he was the king and they got along. Apparently they were good. It said, after this, the king of the Ammonites died and Hanun and his son were placed, it reigned in his place. And David said, I will deal loyally with Hanun, the son of Nahash, as the, his father dealt loyally with me. So David sent by his servants to console him concerning his father. And basically, he sent him there, and, and David sent men to go talk to Hanan to give his condolences. Well, Hanan basically, they see, he had people tell him that, or Hanan ended up telling the servants, said, hey, he's coming to scope out your stuff. He's probably going to take it all. So they ended up shaving part of the beards and all of this of the men who came, embarrassed them. What did that do? It irritated David. And David went and destroyed them. 
So when the Ammonites saw that they had become a stench to David, the Ammonites sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 foot soldiers, and the king of Maka with 1,000 men, and the men of Tob, 12,000 men. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the host of mighty men. Guess who won? He had gotten a whole lot of people. But when God's on your side, you're going to be the one who wins every time. In Deuteronomy 23, this is how a stench between Israel and the Ammonites and the Moabites, how bad it got. And this is what God says. He says, no Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of them may enter the assembly of the Lord because they did not meet you with bread and with water on the way when you came out of Egypt. And because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse you. So, he, God was irritated with these people. And again, these were kin of the Israelites. But if you remember the story, when they came up out of Egypt and wanted to cross through their country... Neither the Moabites or the Ammonites would actually let them pass through. So God said, forget it. We're not going to do this anymore. These people can never come into the assembly of the Lord. And Haziel said, why does my Lord weep? He answered. He says, because I know the evil that you will do to the people of Israel. You will set on fire their fortresses and you will kill their young men with sword and dash in pieces their little ones and rip open their pregnant women. Now this is actually the king of Syria, but he actually was one who actually fought with the Ammonites and went in there. So if God hates things that destroying the innocent and having problems with babies being killed in utero back then, what do you think God thinks of that today? I don't think God's mind has changed on it at all. I'm going to share with you all a story. After dental school, I, I did what's called a general practice residency. And during that year, I spent, um, I was spent it in a hospital for a year, doing dentistry during the day. And then typically, <clears throat> every second to third night, I was on call for the emergency room and would go in and help in the emergency room. They... I think I sutured up everything in sight because they like the dentist to do suturing because I think it's boring for them and we're so meticulous on our details that we make pretty sewing uh, when we do it. But they were incredible. Now if you ever go into a hospital and you have a guy come in and tell you something, I always say, what are your credentials? Because I put in spinal taps, I put in chest tubes, I've done all kinds of stuff and I went in and said, hi, I'm Dr. Logan. And then, I had a physician there guiding me and helping me, so it was wonderful. I was getting some incredible training. But there's one night that I will never forget. There was a young girl. She was 23, 24. And she was in a Jeep, open-top Jeep, roll bar and all this. And she was in an accident, and the roll bar rolled over her pelvis and crushed her pelvis. Literally laying on the table there, her pelvis didn't stick up this far off the, off the table. It was completely crushed. But what is so memorable to me is that she was three months pregnant. And the baby miscarried. And when that baby miscarried, I'd never seen a fetus before. I'd never seen a little baby in utero before. And this little baby had hands, it had feet, it had everything that was there. And so I, you, you look at this, that was 10 weeks and 4 days, this picture. But that's about how big this little baby was. But there is head, neck, feet, hands, arms, legs. This little baby was a baby. So, I don't know. I stop and think, if God didn't like babies being ripped from the womb back then, does he now? Food for thought. So, oppressing the innocent. God gives us scripture about that. 
<clears throat> in Exodus 23 and 7, he says, Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. In Deuteronomy 27, it says, Curse be anyone who takes a bribe to shed blood, innocent blood, and all the people shall say, Amen. Assisting the defenseless. It talks to us about that. In Psalm 15, it says, Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right. He, does not put his, who, he, he who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. In Jeremiah, it says, If you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, the land that I gave of old to your fathers forever. You're getting a recurring thing. Take care of the innocent. So a few thoughts for today, if we stop and look at the Ammonites and how God was against them. In Exodus 21, if men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judge decide. But if there is any further injury, you shall appoint as a penalty life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Do you think God took the caring and the injury of innocence serious? He did under the old covenant. You got a lady who's pregnant. The baby, something happens. Whatever happens to the baby, it happens to you. That's pretty stout. More thoughts for today. In Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Do you think God knows us? It says, I formed you in the womb. I knew you. God knows us in the womb. If you look at Psalms, this is one we actually, I remember when um, my daughter Kinsey was born. She was the very first child we had. And on the baby announcements, this was the verse that we put in. So I'm kind of fond of this verse because it reminds me of Kinsey. But it says, you formed, for you informed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it's very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. God knit us together in our mother's womb. Wow. I love that. Knowing that even though I'm getting losing all my hair, he still knit me together that way. That's pretty cool. Okay, so let's look at Moab. We're going to go on from there. Moab is right down here. It's actually down south of where Ammon was. And again, it is the Moabites, descendants of Lot's daughter from the incestuous relationship he had. Ooh, I'm going to hurry. It says, thus both the daughters, we talked about it, we read this early, but said he is the father of the Moabites today, talking about Moab. Let's kind of go through it. I'm, you know, say, okay, he was lots, and then just, sometimes it's easy to lose track of how this really came through. Let's kind of look at a little genealogy here. First off, you have Shem. Now, Shem, if you remember, was one of the sons of Noah. You had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Japheth, yeah, that's it. And then you go on down, you have our facts of Sheila, Eber, Peleg, Reo, Sarag, Nahor, and then Terah. Now, Terah, who is there, had Abraham. Abraham then had uh, his sons, Isaac, and you know, you go down to Isaac, and you have Esau and Jacob. But Haran, who was one of Terah's son, Terah's sons, that was Lot. And then Lot had Moab, and then he also had ben -Abi. So that is kind of the, the path that it goes down. When you stop and look, okay, how does this genealogy work? This is the way that it came down. and Because it's really, it's, okay, it was Lot, Abraham's nephew, great. Well, where did all that come from? Well, this is how it came through. 
So to Moab, what was the problem? They had, theirs was for disrespect, injustice, and revenge. <clears throat> Went through and God said that he uh, would have for three transgressions of four for a Moab. He will not revoke punishment because he burned to lime the bones of the king of Edom. Hmm. Goes on in there and he said he'll send fire on Moab and the strongholds will be cut down and all of this. Now, the interesting thing is, whoops, that's the Moabite stone. It's also called the Misha Steli. This is a thing that was found in 1869, I think. Hold on, let me look and remember. It was 1868 in Dibon in Moab, which is about 20 miles east of the Jordan River. This was a stone, again, it wasn't found until 1868. Now, up until this time... There literally was nothing that anyone had ever found about the land of Moab. Many people didn't believe that Moab actually existed at one point. Um, it is gone today. But it wasn't until this, the only thing that talked about Moab was actually Scripture. As we know, Scripture talks about it, it's real. So what ends up happening, they found this Moabite stone in 1868, and the Germans tried to go in and buy it, and the French ended up offering more money, and they didn't quite have it all out. Uh, it was actually found um, on accident. Well, it ends up that a lot of the migrant people in that area heard about this Misha stone, or, and, uh, or the Moabite stone, whichever you want to call it, and they decided that they were going to destroy this and take pieces. So what they did is they actually went in lit a fire around it, put it on fire, threw water on it afterwards, and then broke it. It actually was about four feet high, two feet wide, and about 14 inches thick. So they broke it into pieces. Now, over time, they ultimately were able to get back together a good bit of it. It said, last I read, it was there was, they found 669 of the 1,100 consonants that were there. But they could ultimately get a majority of what the writing had actually said. And this was by Misha, the king of Moab. Lo and behold, the Moabites did exist. So things to know about Moab. First off, Moab was born of an incestuous relationship. They were relatives of the Israelites. They were actually given their own land, it tells us in Deut Deuteronomy. But they were an idolatrous people. They actually ended up leading Israel astray in many things. The enemy, they, but they ended up, they were enemies of Israel, just like the Ammonites. Nobody likes each other back then. And the Israelites, even though they're family, they still don't like each other. They were not welcome to come in when the wall was rebuilt in Jerusalem. And if you go through and look and remember the verse where it talked about, God said the Ammonites or the Moabites cannot come into the meeting of the Lord. God also judged the Moabites in Isaiah 15 and 1. It talks how God judged the Moabites for what they had done. In 2 Kings 3, 4, and 5, it says, Now Misha of Moab was a sheep breeder, and he had to deliver to the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 1,000 rams. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So the, apparently they had a decent relationship, but when the king of Moab, when Misha uh, died, I mean, when Ahab died, he, Misha came in and basically rebelled against Israel. 1 Samuel 14, it says, When Saul had taken the kingship over Israel, he fought against all his enemies on every side. Who do you see a lot of these? Moab, Edomites, the Ammonites, Zoba, the Philistines. I mean, this is a lot of the people that God is saying for, you know, three transgressions and for, for four, I will not revoke punishment. Judges 11. It says, Israel then sent messengers to the king of Edom saying, please let us pass. And this is the same thing. Moab would not let the Israelite nation pass through Moab when they were coming out of uh, Egypt. Now, if you also remember, the uh, Moabites are the ones who tried to hire Balaam to go in and curse the Israelite nation. We all know how that came out. Um, didn't work too well, and donkey did some pretty cool things. I'd love to see a donkey talk. <laughs> I think it'd be neat. Um, but I don't know if, he, if I whipped him and he started talking back to me. I don't know if I, that might scare me more than anything else. Numbers 22. 
So, so Balak, the son of Zippor, talks about this and talks about how um, Balak ended up going in and he hired Balaam to come and curse the people for me. And why? Because they were too mighty for him. That's why he wanted to go in and hire the, uh, to curse them. So for disrespect, injustice, and revenge, thus says the Lord, I will do it because he burned to lime the bones of the king of Edom. Now there actually is not any record of this other than this being mentioned in Amos that they burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. Now what this basically meant was they went through and they, they think that it was when the Moabites, the Edomites ended up getting together with Israel to fight against Moab. And so they think that's what it is. And they don't even know which king it was. But the Edomite king, what it says that they did is they went in and basically dug him up out of his grave and burned his bones till they turned to lime. That's a pretty disrespectful thing. So again, no record has been preserved this. We think it's collected to the, uh, connected to the war in 2 Kings 3. And this is where Joram and Israel of Israel and Jehoshaphat of Judah waged war against the Moabites. And the king of Edom was with them. Do they think that's what it is? But again, we're not certain completely. But stop and think about this. How would we feel if somebody went and got George Washington's bones and took them out and burned them to lime? Desecrating a body is terrible. Desecrating anybody is terrible, but we probably wouldn't like it if somebody went and got that. Well, desecrating the dead was even a bigger thing back then than what it means to us today. It was something if you dug somebody up and desecrated the body. But that's what ended up happening. God was irritated with it. So God calls us to respect other people. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. I'm going to go through these quick because we're going to do it. There are a lot of prophecies of Moab's doom, in case you want to go through and read those. This is Moab today in southern Jordan. Moab's not around anymore. Again, nobody ever even knew it was there. This is what Moab looks like. But you know what came out good out of Moab? Ruth. It ended up being in the lineage of David. How did such a precious, sweet lady come out of such an evil terrible place. Pretty amazing. Thoughts for us. Talks about do justice and righteousness. Do not do wrong or violence to people. But if you will not obey these words, God says that their house will become a desolation. Other verses. He said, he said to do, you do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. These are things that God tells us every day. Again, I'm kind of scooting on these because I don't want you. But I can tell you, God's going to punish all who live contrary to his will. And that's something I think we need to focus on. Fortunately, we have salvation, we have mercy, we have grace. And without it, I'd be in a big bind. But he wants us to not live. I, there I, I, I say those double negatives. Not live contrary to his will. Thoughts for us in Galatians. For whatever one sows that, that, sows that he will also reap. In Romans, so then each of us will give an account for himself to God. John 15, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil will go to the resurrection of judgment. 1 Corinthians 5, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due to, for him for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Ephesians, for we are, in, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We must be doing the works of God. This is the work of God that you must believe in him who has sent him. I'm going to put this verse and have you look at this. This is an interesting thing for your friends who say that baptism is a work. This says that belief is a work. Interesting insight. So, the lion, we'll look at those last time. Those are the things that he done. And next time we're going to go in and we're going to look at Judah and Israel starting next time. Appreciate the attention. I'd ask if there are any questions or comments, but I didn't finish quite enough time to do that. Appreciate y'all being here.